And uh, if you get your Bibles, we're going to start in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 16. Um, we're going to be flipping around today. There's going to be a variety of texts, and so uh, they'll also be up on the screen. But I want to give you a chance that, to, uh, uh, to turn there. Uh, a preacher went to visit an elderly woman who was part of his congregation, and uh, as he sat there on the couch, he noticed that there was a bowl of peanuts that was just kind of right there in front of him. And so uh, he, he said, you know what, D- do you mind if I have, you know, a few of these peanuts? And, and she said, no, not at all. And, um, and so they sat there and they talked for quite, you know, for, for quite a while, uh, you know, for quite a bit. And, and uh, he realized that instead of just eating just a few peanuts, that he actually ate the whole bowl. And he said, man, I, I'm terribly sorry. I, I didn't mean to eat all of these. Uh, I just meant to eat a few. And she said, oh, I, listen, that, that's fine. She said, in fact, ever since I lost my teeth, the only thing I've really been able to do is suck the chocolate off of them anyway. <laughs> that's disturbing, right? I mean, it's a little, you know, uh, on a few levels. Um, uh, we've been going through and talking about these seven deadly sins, and we've been, we've been touching on a variety of particular sinful areas, particular dangerous areas that, uh, that we all struggle with, uh, these areas that can be uh, damaging to our, our ultimately to our relationship with God. And so far, we've covered pride and, and lust and anger. Well, today, we're gonna, I pre- I'm going to preach on a subject that I have probably never preached an entire sermon on. I know I've hit it from time to time. I'm going to preach on something you've probably never heard a sermon on, if, if I'm guessing, um, but we're going to do it today. Today we're going to talk about gluttony. And um, we don't talk about gluttony much, do we? Uh, we don't talk about gluttony much in, in the church, and I think for several reasons. For one, we don't take it very seriously. We, we joke, most of us, we joke about how much we eat. Uh, someone said, uh, I, I'm not overweight, I'm just under height. Right, you know, I'm, I'm the I'm the perfect you know high, you know, perfect weight for somebody at six uh, six foot seven. Uh, or we sort of wink at it, right? It's, you know, it's not that big of a deal. You know, if I tell somebody I'm a preacher, you know, and I've literally people have told me this and or said this to me, like, well, you must love fried chicken, then, right? Well, I mean, yeah, I'd love fried chicken. I don't know if it has anything to do with me being a preacher, but I, you know, I, I've liked it ever since I, I was a a kid. Um, another reason we don't talk about this though is that maybe in particular in the, in our culture in, in the South. You know, preachers will often talk about the dangers of alcohol or gambling or smoking, but, but very little about, about gluttony at all. Uh, my oldest daughter, Katie Ray, who, is, uh, who works in, in a church, and she does worship uh, uh, at a church just up the road, and, and I was talking to her, you know, about, you know, this series and was preaching, and I mentioned something about gluttony. She was like, ooh, I mean, that, that's, that may be offensive, right? And, and I get it, right? I, I get all of that, and, and, but I can't just, you know, Pick and choose, right? What I'm going to preach on that's just going to be comfortable. It's just going to be easy for us to, to deal with. In fact, I believe it's my job that God wants me to make you and me, because of this hits me first, right? Wholly uncomfortable each week. In fact, I, I think that's the job of preaching. And not so that you'll feel bad about yourself, not so that you'll certainly won't feel condemned or guilt ridden, none of that, no, but just so that you and I will trust God in every area and aspect in our life to see just as we've been singing just how good he truly is now before i get into this let me just say something that's really really important because you probably this is probably already a little bit uncomfortable in fact you may assume you may be here this morning you may just assume that you can look around and figure out who struggles with this particular sin you, 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 know, you may say, well, I, you know, I may not know that person that they're dealing with lust or, uh, you know, anger or whatever it may be, but like uh, this one's apparent. Listen, nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. Every person is different. We have different body types, metabolism, age plays a fact, gender, mobility, DNA, all of those things. Listen, I know people who, again, if we're thinking about gluttony in terms of food, that people who are skinny as a rail, way skinnier than me, but eat way, way more, right? So don't assume that you just can figure this sin out by looking around with our eyeballs. You just can't. In fact, did you know that the, the scripture, the Bible, doesn't define gluttony as being overweight there's no warning about your bmi range in scripture now there's some concerns with our health that we'll talk about but gluttony isn't about our weight necessarily 
And so let's take a deep breath and let's see what we're dealing with here. Let's see what God's Word has to say because I, I think I want to be very clear with all of these uh, sins that we're covering here. Like we, we struggle with all of these in different forms, but there's hope, there's victory to be found in Jesus. And so what is gluttony? What is it? Well, there's no Bible verse that we can look up. Or there's no definition that you can just look up in Scripture like, well, here's what gluttony is, or here's what pride is, or here's what lust is, and you, know, you get a clear definition. But instead, with what I wanted to do today, I want to look at a few verses that will sort of give us some context around this and maybe help us determine a little bit closer to what we're dealing with here when it comes to this deadly sin. This first one comes from Ezekiel 16, verse 49. And in fact, this one may be somewhat surprising to you because this uh, scripture verse I'm going to read, um, most of us when we think about, uh, it's, it's going to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, and most of the time when we think about Sodom and Gomorrah, we just associate it with sexual sins, homosexuality in particular. But listen to what Ezekiel 16, verse 49 says. Sodom's sins were pride, gluttony, and laziness while the poor and needy suffered outside her door. She was proud and committed detestable sins, so I wiped her out as you have seen. Now, it's interesting that gluttony, according to this passage, is part of the reason why God destroyed Sodom. Maybe you didn't know that. Of course, there's other deadly sins right there that we've talked about in this series, uh, pride and laziness as well. But if nothing else, when we read a passage like that, it pertains to gluttony, like immediately we ought to be thinking a little bit more serious about this, right? I mean, if this is associated with God destroying a city, then we probably need to perk up a little bit and at least pay attention to what he has to say here. But here's what something sort of, not as an off topic, but it has something to do with this that I want us to point out, church. Because if, if we have to be honest about something here, one of the reasons that young people in particular, are leaving the church in droves. One of the reasons that they cite is for, they say the church, they're just hypocrites. The church isn't consistent in her message. That, that we're quick to point out the sins of others, but maybe not, you know, we're ready to overlook some of the sins that maybe affects us. And listen, I get that. And, and I think some of those critics are, are valid. Listen, the world... And particular young people need to see us as the church model transparency, honesty, sharing truth, holding out lots of grace, though, as we do it, right? It's fine to be troubled by the sins of Sodom that are sexual in nature, and we should. And I get it. Listen, there's a lot of things going on in our world today that's super, super troubling. I'm right there with you. But we also need to be troubled when poor people are neglected. You see what you see that that passage? We also need to be troubled when when needy people are suffering. Uh, when was the last time you you saw a church upset over overt pride that's mentioned in this passage? And so we got to be consistent. Amen. We got to be consistent with our message across the board. It doesn't matter if that's your political team, your sports team, your Sunday school, like whatever it may be, the word of God hasn't changed. And so, uh, at least right up front, we see, hey, this is, we got to take this maybe a little bit more seriously. You know, what, what's going on here? Uh, let's look at another passage. This is going to be out of Proverbs 23. You're welcome to flip there if you want, um, or it's, it's going to be up there on the screen. Proverbs 23, uh, I'm going to read verses 1 and, 1 and 2. And if you want to, you can, you can, uh, you can write these down. I'm going to actually be in Proverbs 20. I'm going to be in I'm going to be there a little bit later, so you can go ahead and flip there if you want to. But Proverbs 23, verse 1 says, When you sit to dine with a ruler, note well what is before you, and put a knife to your throat if you're given to gluttony. Now, Proverbs, as we know, these are sayings of the wise, right? These are, most of these are written by Solomon, and, and uh, they're practical for our life. In fact, many of you read a proverb every day. That's a, that, that's a great, great practice. I would encourage you to do so. But this proverb has something to do with sitting down and eating a meal uh, and maybe being offered food or drink that you normally wouldn't get. And as a result, there's a temptation to overindulge. I, uh, a few years ago, I was treated uh, for a meal with a bunch of pastors at uh, Ruth 
Chris Steakhouse. I don't know if that's if there's any around here or uh, some of you maybe you've ate there. Uh, it's a pretty high end steakhouse, at least for me. I don't you know I don't uh, get that opportunity very often. But we, we came and and they brought these dishes out and and uh, all the, these appetizers and eventually steak and like it was a real temptation just to want to kind of shovel all this in. Like I don't get this very often. Like let's just dump it all here and, and this is sort of the idea. But the writer says, if you're tempted to do that, put a knife to your throat. Now, I, I, think, there's, uh, I think that's hyperbole, much in, in the same way that Jesus would say, hey, if your right eye causes you to stumble, uh, gouge it out. But, the, but it's, it's, you know, the, the point is making it strong. He's saying, look, it's better to stick a knife to your throat uh, if you're given to gluttony in a situation like this. And, of course, the principle here is self-control, right? And, and have it, don't we know, like, Almost all these sins that we're covering, like it goes back to self-control and how important self-control is. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that one of the fruits of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in our life is self-control. Because I ain't got enough self-control on my own, right? I mean, I'm not going to be able to muster some of these things up in order to do this on my own unless the Holy Spirit is working in me and transforming my heart and my life. It's got to be a supernatural work. And in one more verse, just to, just to lay some groundwork here, uh, Proverbs 23, verse 19. It says, listen, my son, and be wise, and set your heart on the right path. Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat, for drunkards and gluttons become poor and drowsiness clothes them in rags. And so if you were to take those three passages, so the first one you've got this, you know, the one that was this reference to Sodom, the seriousness of this sin, the second one from this earlier part of this proverb, that the, the restraint of this sin is really important. And in this passage helps us, I think, to understand a basic definition. And, and this is a definition that you already knew, right? That gluttony is food or drink, in excess. It's food or drink in excess. And by the way, uh, the drink is almost always associated with food when it pertains to, to gluttony. They're, they're always, almost always in the same category. So excessive drinking or excessive eating is really the simplest way to define what gluttony is. It goes beyond that. I'm not going to, I don't have time to go uh, into this too much, but gluttony can be expense, eating foods that are uh, too expensive, right? It, it can be, exp- you know, it can be eating food that's really expensive on a regular basis. You go out to eat, uh, you overspend. Maybe you grew up and you had, you know, all you ate was bologna and vainy sausage. You're like, I ain't eating that anymore. Like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to eat the good stuff from, from now on, right? It could be that. It could be that. Gluttony can actually occur when we eat without being thankful. That, that doesn't mean that you have to necessarily pray every meal before every meal, although that's a good, uh, a good habit. But it can be that. It can be eating and drinking without recognizing that God is your provider. But it's broader, right? So it's broader than just this, maybe just a simple definition. Um, but, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's more than just simply eating too much for, uh, for lunch one day. I, I went out just this past Thursday uh, with a bunch of preachers for lunch and and they wanted to go to the Mexican buffet there. And, t- and, I'm, th- and right, I'm, I'm thinking to myself as I'm getting plate number two, I'm preaching about gluttony this week, right? Um, and so, um, but it's bigger than just simply overeating, uh, although it's part of it. Listen, and then we're going to narrow it in just a little bit here. The reason this is such a deadly sin, and the reason Scripture sounds such a, an important alarm here, is because gluttony in its various forms, can take the position in our lives, a position in our lives that is meant for God alone. All right? So keep that in mind as we go through this. And by the way, have you noticed how often this is the case? That God gives us good things. God gives us gifts in our life and in various forms, and we take a good thing and we turn it into an idol. Right? Isn't that what happened? I mean, see, gluttony in its root form, it's idolatry. It's idolatry. This is why, this is why listen, it's obviously not bad to crave food. God's made us in a way to crave food. We need food to live. God gave you 10,000 taste buds. Aren't you thankful? 
I'm grateful for that. We see in the Old Testament that food and drink are, 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 are a feasting, are very much a prominent part of worship in the Old Testament. We read in the book of Acts that uh, the early church, they ate together in their homes with glad and sincere hearts. Jesus was constantly eating with people in the Gospels. I just did an entire sermon series on that just a few uh, uh, months ago. I, I realize uh, like, uh, like it's such such an important, like we, we see this, right? And listen, even uh, what I'm going to say next is probably going to come to a surprise to you because of our culture and, and really just sort of the way that, it's, that it takes place. But even scripturally speaking, wine has actually seen, and we see this especially throughout the Old Testament, as actually a, uh, as a gift from God. Look at what Ecclesiastes 9 says. Go eat your food with gladness. Drink your wine with a joyful heart, for God has already approved what you do. Now, Scripture says a lot about the sin of drunkenness. And the Bible blares a warning sign about excessive drinking in so many places. In fact, I think you can make a case for avoiding alcohol altogether today. We know it can be addictive. We know that a single night with too much alcohol can lead to a lifetime of regret. Many of us have suffered because of alcohol abuse and someone that we love. But the Bible sees this, right, in the same way of, of, of food. Uh, it, 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 and again, if it was different, I'd preach it. But God gives us these gifts, right? Food, drink, sex, and they can all be enjoyed in the right context. But the problem is, in our brokenness, in our sinfulness, we take these things and we make them the main things. We take these things that were never meant to be the main things and we make them the main things in our life. And when you begin to, to worship food and drink and sex, that's when your life can really fall apart. Food becomes gluttony, drink becomes drunkenness, and sin becomes fornication. See, gluttony is not just this physical problem. I, I know that probably for most of us, we come in here and we think of gluttony, we think, well, this is just, it's a physical problem. Listen, it's not just a physical problem. It's a spiritual issue at its core. It's all about, it's an issue of who or what we will worship. So let me give you some reasons here why gluttony is such a deadly problem. In fact, look at that proverb there, verse, uh, Proverbs 23, verse 19 again. I'm going to read it one more time. It says, listen, my son, and be wise. Set your heart on the right path. Don't join those who drink too much wine or, or gorge themselves on meat. For drunkards and gluttons become poor, and drowsiness clothes them in rags. Notice one of the things the text says about gluttony. It says that gluttony can lead to poverty. Gluttony can lead to poverty. Drunkards and gluttons become poor. Drowsiness clothes them in in rags. You know, a few uh, weeks ago, I mentioned uh, the story about Jacob and Esau, right? And we're, probably most of us are familiar with Jacob and Esau. They were brothers. They were actually twins, but they couldn't be any different uh, than, than one another. Uh, Jacob was, uh, or Esau rather, was a hunter. He was an outdoorsman. Jacob, uh, he, he stayed closer to home, apparently liked to cook. But Genesis 25 says this, once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. And he said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That's why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore on an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew, and he ate and he drank, and he got up and left. And so Esau despised his birthright. Now, that is in Scripture there in Genesis. To, it's included to show us that Jacob would be the, uh, the son th through which the covenant promise of God would be fulfilled. Like that, you know, Abraham and then Jacob and then all his lineage ultimately would lead us to Christ, Right? Um, but I also think it teaches us something about gluttony. Esau was willing to sacrifice his future and the very blessing of God for a moment of fleeting pleasure. And of course, the same thing still happens today. 
maybe not like that exactly, but, but gluttony can and still causes major problems. It causes problems in our finances, right? It can, again, if you're overspending, if you're overdoing it as it pertains to food, gluttony can really drain your bank account. Overeating can, uh, can make us lethargic and unproductive. After lunch, maybe your supervisor notices that your, your, uh, your productivity drops big time. And maybe it, you, you know, it you know, potentially could cost a job. Maybe they notice that you're not as healthy as you once were. Of course, we know that alcohol can certainly cause problems with our ability to have a job or to keep a job or to, to maintain it in any way. So gluttony is deadly on one hand because it can lead us to poverty. Another reason is, is that it's deadly is because it can lead to sickness. It can lead to sickness. Uh, Proverbs 25, 16 says, If you find honey, eat just enough. Too much of it and you'll vomit. One of the blessings and curses, really, in our world today is the amount of different types of foods that we have literally at our fingertips, right? If we're hungry today, we don't have to go out and kill something and then prepare it and then boil some water and cook a fire. Like, we, you know, if we're hungry, we go to the pantry, we get the Doritos and put in the work, right? I mean, we just, you know, it's, we just, it's so easy for us. We just, we, and, and listen, there's nothing wrong with Doritos, but too much, like the way I do sometimes, can cause a problem. And if you're eating to the point to where it's making you sick, or you're too full, if you're too lethargic, you know that you've ate too much. And of course, we know it can make us sick in terms of our health. We worry sometimes about evil and terrorist attacks and, and all that. But listen, you're far more likely to die because of your eating and drinking habits than you are anything else. Uh, cardiovascular disease is still the leading cause of death in our country. And of course, some of that can be unrelated to our uh, eating habits, but much of it is. High blood pressure, diabetes, uh, weight issues can cause major problems. Uh, and, and we have to face it. I mean, Americans, Americans, we're, we're larger than we've ever been. In 2009, the, uh, New York, they rebuilt Yankee Stadium, uh, but they lost 9,000 seats. And the reason is, is because they had to add three inches to each of the seat. Now, again, I don't say that to make anybody feel bad. Um, there's a variety of reasons why people struggle with their weight. It's not related to gluttony, okay? So don't misunderstand me. But our diet can be a problem. Our a lack of exercise, self-control, that can be problematic. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians 6. Don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? So you're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. See, the church there at Corinth, they uh, had these new believers in the church that were causing a little bit of a stir. They were saying, you know what, you can separate, there's a, you know, it's, it, there, you can separate the, the body and the soul, right? And this idea had its root, which is what we would you know, refer to as Greek dualism. It's this idea that you can separate the physical from the spiritual. And they had all these ideas, right? And it was causing problems, and they were saying, hey, this is why it's okay to, you know, to, to abuse your body. This is why it's okay to sleep with this person or this, you know, this. And Paul's writing says, no, 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 we don't separate the two. You don't separate the physical from the spiritual. And, and you see what he says? If you've received Christ. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. That's a big deal. It's a big deal. Now, we, we, the, the closest thing that we might have today to, we don't have a temple, is, but maybe a church building. Obviously, they're, they're not the same, but nobody would come in here and trash this place intentionally. Nobody would come in here and say, hey, this is just a building, this isn't any big deal, I can, you know, do this. No, there's, there's reverence, there's respect, but, but a church building is much less significant according to what Paul says. He says our bodies are the very temple of God, the temple of God. And many of us treat a building like this better than our own bodies, in which the very Spirit of God dwells. Uh, Robert McShane was born in uh, May of 1813 in Edinburgh, Scotland. At the age of 14, McShane entered divinity school at Edinburgh. At eight, 18, he uh, uh, 
or excuse me, at age 14, he entered Edinburgh University. At age 18, he was, uh, went to Divinity School. By age 22, he was preaching regularly. And then one year later, at 23, he was officially ordained in the ministry and was assigned to oversee St. Peter's Church, a congregation of about 1,100 members. McShane became uh, known all throughout Scotland as a godly leader, a powerful preacher. In fact, uh, he was one of the most influential preachers in Europe during the 19th century. Many attribute his success to his devotional life. In fact, over the past two years, I have followed McShane's reading plan uh, for reading the Bible. It's fantastic. But it's been said that McShane woke up every morning, 6.30, prayed for two hours, had breakfast with his family. At 10, he began his church work. He would do that all the way up into the evening. The only break in his schedule would be on Sundays when McShane would spend nearly six hours in Scripture and prayer. He was super well organized. He uh, kept notes on the people he visited, the scriptures that were shared, all of that. But at the age of 25, McShane was forced into early retirement due to health problems. While he found other ways to be involved in ministry, it just wasn't the same. And two months shy of his 30th birthday, Robert McShane died uh, at his home in his bed. Now, he had some other related health-related issues, but McShane admitted, he said, part of his problems were self-induced, namely unhealthy eating habits. He said he treated his body so poor, and he felt guilty about it. Just before he died, McShane said this, God gave me a message to deliver and a horse to ride, but I've killed the horse, and now I cannot deliver the message. See, that's part of what makes this sin so deadly. It can lead to poverty. It can lead to sickness. And then third, it can lead us away from God. It can lead us away from God. And again, this is why this is much more, this isn't just simply a physical issue. This is a spiritual issue at its root. A few years ago, Kyle Ottoman wrote a book. Maybe some of you read it. It's called God's at War. And in this book, Ottoman tackles many of the little, the little G gods that we deal with in our world today, these idols. But the very first little G God that he tackles in his book is not entertainment, success, romance, or even self. The first one he mentions is food. And he says this, eating is good. The problem is that every gift God gives us can be twisted into a lure to pull us away from him. And that's really the point that I'm hoping that you'll see this morning. Food, drink, like they're fine, but when you turn to them the way that you should turn to God, that's when you know they've become an idol. Listen, when you've had a bad day at work and you turn to alcohol as a way to escape, you've created an idol. You've fallen into gluttony. When you're sad, because of the circumstances in your life and you're in a difficult season and instead of turning to God, you turn to food, you've created an idol. You've fallen into gluttony. When you're lonely and your loneliness leads you to excess of food or drink, and again, you're turning to them for comfort, you've created an idol and you've fallen into gluttony. When you're unsatisfied with your life, and you try to fill that void up by the things that you put in your mouth, and they bring you some temporary cheer, you know that you've fallen, you've created this idol, and you've fallen into gluttony. When you eat, and you're full, and yet you go back to get some more because you don't want to face a problem that you have to deal with, or you don't want to think about something else, you've created an idol, right? You've fallen in to gluttony. Do you see where this leads? See, your, your plate can be full, and yet you're totally empty. That's the problem with this sin. You, you can have a full plate, but an empty heart. The things that might temporarily fill this void, make us feel better in the moment, they don't lead us closer to God. They lead us further away from Him. Listen, if you're lonely this morning, if you're afraid, if you're discouraged, you're struggling in some way, turn to Jesus. He promises to be there. Amen? Listen, one day Jesus was traveling and He went through this Samaritan town. And He met a lady there. And 
And she, this is what she, he, he went to the place where they would go, and they would go to this well, and that's where they would go to get water. And, and her life was a wreck. She had one failed marriage after another after another, and she just showed up, and, and she was thirsty that day for water, but she was thirsty for more than just water. She was unsatisfied. In fact, she, her cup may have been full with H2O, yet she was still thirsty. And Jesus offered her living water. He said this in John 4. Everyone who drinks this water is going to be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Church, remember this morning that true satisfaction, it's not found in a full belly. It's found in Jesus. In fact, here's my main point. Gluttony will starve you if Christ is left off your plate. Gluttony will starve you if Christ is left off your plate. Augustine repeatedly said, the Lord has made us for himself. Our hearts will be restless until they find their rest in him. And so my question this morning for all of us is like, what are you trying to fill that void with? Well, what are you trying to fill in your life to, that you're putting someplace, something that only is where God should be? That, that Again, Augustine, the Lord's made us for himself. We're restless. We're restless. We're going to look for other things until we find our rest in him. You know, this past, uh, this past Sunday night, we, we had our fall festival. And it's always great to, to have an event like that, to have a fall festival. We get an opportunity to have some fun, dress up, meet some people, pass out candy, d do all the things. Um, Tyler ordered, he ordered a, uh, a cotton candy, a, a cotton candy thing that makes cotton candy, right? Uh, I hadn't really seen, well, I've seen them, but I hadn't really, uh, you know, it's been a long time since I've had uh, cotton candy. I used to always love it as a kid, and uh, I loved always being able to get it. Um, but, but, but the things that in our life, like uh, that, that we choose, uh, you know, that, we've, that we try to fill up these voids with, it's a lot like cotton candy, right? Think about it. Cotton candy. It tastes good, it looks good, it smells good. But you realize something, right? As soon as you bite that cotton candy and you put it in your mouth, what do you realize? There's no substance there. It just melts. Like it, there's nothing, I mean, I guess you could take a big old wad and you could pull in, you know, then you might be able to chew on it a little bit. But even then, there's not going to be any satisfaction long term. The same way is thing is true with anything you try to fill up your life with, church, that apart from Christ. Gluttony is deadly because you're, it's, you know, it's this, it's like cotton candy. It's like, yeah, it's good for a little while. And it fills up a little thing, right? But in the end, there's nothing there. There's no substance at all. Uh, bow your heads. I, I just want you to have just an opportunity to, to, to think, to reflect. Is there an area in your life that you're trying to replace Jesus with? Is there an idol that you need to destroy today? You know, like you know it. And, and listen, every single one of us, we, we, this is a battle, okay? The, the, none of us are, are innocent here. None of us are perfect here. Uh, you know, if it's not gluttony, it's something else, right? There, there's something out there, perhaps, possibly, again, whether it's sex or food or drink or, or something else that we're trying to fill up our lives and our hearts with. What idol do you need crushed today? Gluttony will starve you if Christ is left off your plate. Everything that you search for, it'll starve you if Jesus is left off your plate. So what is it for you? Or maybe for you today, maybe you've never asked Jesus for living water. Maybe you've never come to him and said, Lord, I'm empty I'm empty. 
give me what you have. I want living water that's going to well up to me to eternal life. Maybe you've never done that. Even now, just to to cry out to the Lord. What is it for you? Father God, I do just come to you, Lord, and just confessing. God, that there's there's areas, Lord, there's no doubt that whether it's food or something else, that every one of us, including me, Lord, that we we've tried to fill ourselves up with. But Lord, may today be a reminder that you alone can satisfy us. And Father, may today be a reminder of the things that we're tempted to turn to, Lord, and no longer. We're going to trust you in every area in our life. God, help us to get serious about this. No more winking, no more laughing, no more ha-ha, but God, just trusting you. Or Father, maybe today if there's someone who's never asked Jesus for living water, maybe never confessed the name of Christ, placed their faith in Him. Lord, turn to Him and say, I I believe that maybe today, God, that they would do that very thing and come into His family. God, we love You. We just ask that You lead us and challenge us and change us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Let's be standing.